All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We've had a lot of great events during National News Literacy Week, and we're thrilled to have so many of you with us today. I think part of the interest in this session is just that it's all of us have sort of had the thought one time or another, how can somebody possibly believe that? But sometimes it's not ignorance or lack of news literacy uh, that's at play. Sometimes it's just our brains are wired to think and believe things. So to flesh this out, we asked our Senior Vice President of Research and Design, uh, Peter Adams, to talk to some experts who could help us all better understand why we fall for lies and misinformation. Peter began his career as a classroom teacher in the New York City schools through Teach for America, and he's also taught in the Chicago Public Schools at Roosevelt University and at Chicago City Colleges Wilbur Wright Campus. In addition, he has worked with the New York City Teaching Fellows Program and with After School Matters and as an independent education consultant. So I'm going to hand it over to Peter in just a moment, but I do have some unfortunate news. Dr. Sima Yasmin has, uh, she let us know a few minutes ago that she's having some technical problems and she won't be able to join us today. So it's just gonna be Dr. It's gonna be a great conversation. So please stick around and, and let's all learn a little bit about our brains and this information. And then one last note, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A section and we will keep an eye out on those and, and get them to Peter. So without uh, any further ado, let's get started. Peter. Thanks, Mike. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the introduction there and getting us started. Um, as Mike mentioned, my name is Peter Adams. I'm from the News Literacy Projects Research and Design Team uh, uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Um, we organized this session uh, because people like to think that they are rational decision makers. You know, generally speaking, I think we all tend to think that we have a pretty good grasp on reality and that we're capable of, of honestly and, and fairly judging things such as news and information uh, that we encounter um, in our feeds. Uh, but there's overwhelming evidence that this is not actually the case. Uh, so, you know, what can we do to protect ourselves from our own biases, uh, our own inherently flawed instincts when it comes to the information that we believe, trust, and act on? And how can we combat uh, the effects of mis and disinformation both on ourselves, but also on our loved ones and on society uh, as a whole. Uh, so to get into these and other important questions, I'm joined today by Dr. Sander Vanderlinden. Uh, he's a professor of social psychology in society in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge and director of the Cambridge Social Decision-Making Lab. Uh, before coming to Cambridge, he held posts at Princeton and Yale, uh, and his research interests center around the psychology of human judgment and decision-making, um, and in particular, He's interested in the social influence and persuasion process, how people are influenced by misinformation uh, and information uh, and gain resistance to persuasion uh, through psychological inoculation. Uh, and on that subject, he has a new book coming out called Foolproof. Some of you may be aware of this coming out in the US in March. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us, um, Sander. I appreciate you, you being here and, and taking the time to join us. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Great. So so let's dive in. Uh, and hello to all those folks joining uh, here. I see some folks from Chicago where I'm based. It's great to have you all here with us today as well. Um, so Sander, one, one big driver um, of the misinformation problem on social media is just the, the, the sheer volume of information that we're exposed to there, um, coupled with the fact that we all have a tendency to kind of scroll through our feeds a little mindlessly, right? Social media platforms are often in fact designed to just keep us on platform, keep us going, keep us scrolling. Um, in fact, you know, there's quite a bit of research that shows that we have kind of two cognitive systems. One's, one that's more automatic, kind of like an autopilot and one that's more reflective and careful and rational. Um, and as you know, there's, there's good reason for this from an evolutionary perspective, right? We can't possibly stop and verify and scrutinize and think about everything we see or do in a day, we kind of have to rely on cognitive shortcuts, what what's people sometimes in the field call heuristics, to navigate the world, um, including the information environment. So my question, as natural and necessary as this automatic system and these mental shortcuts might be, um, what are some of their drawbacks? So what kind of problems do they introduce 
uh, when it comes to our ability to, to recognize um, misinformation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, as you said, there's there's good reason for why people rely on rules of thumb from an evolutionary standpoint, right? We're all given limited time and resources. We have to make quick decisions. Otherwise, we would never get anywhere. But sometimes that can lead us astray. So one, I think one profound example is what we call the truth bias. So people generally have a truth bias. Uh, and so we're generally likely to think that stuff is true uh, when we navigate our information environments. Uh, and I, I think there's good reason for that because you know, most of the time, especially if you if you think of it, as you said, from an evolutionary standpoint, most of the information in our in our environments is not false, is not misleading, right? Most of the time, we're dealing with information that is reasonably accurate. And so it makes sense for people to default to assume that, that most things are true. But when you then shift to an environment where the base rate of information is slightly different, Right, or misinformation might be more common. So for example, think about shifting on, on the social media or other platforms where the prevalence of misinformation is much higher, then all of a sudden that heuristic doesn't do so well because now the base rate is not so low that most of the time it's gonna be fine. In fact, turns out that a lot of the times you're actually interacting with misinformation, but you're still operating on that intuition that most of the things are probably true. So I'll share, I'll like, and so on. So I think the truth bias is, is one example. And related to that is something called illusory truth. So illusory truth is a really prominent and replicated finding, even in, in kids from as young as five years old, that the, the more often we repeat a claim, the more likely our brains are to think that it's true. And this, again, kind of makes sense, right? You know that two plus two is four because it's been repeated to you many, 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 many times. Uh, and so it's what we call fluent. So unfortunately, though, the brain associates this concept of fluency or familiarity uh, as a, with the signal for truth. So the more familiar something feels and the more fluent it is, so the easier it is to process for you. Uh, and so the easier something is to process occurs because something is familiar. It's been repeated a lot. The more likely the brain is to think it's true. Um, and so that's why you get all of these effects uh, around misinformation that people think stuff is true simply because they've heard it before and it's been repeated many times. Uh, and so people must think it's true. And some research even shows that the more you hear something, the less immoral people think it is to share subsequently. Um, and we think that's the case because you know the more familiar something becomes to you, uh, the more true it seems. And so people feel less immoral about sharing something that um, that's actually false because it's been repeated many times. And so I think that that sort of repetition creeps in a lot. Um, and illusory truth is is really pervasive and difficult to get rid of because lies are often repeated um, through multiple channels by influential people. Interesting. Do you, do you think that that illusory truth effect um, is something that bad actors or some bad actors are aware of online and, and, and capitalize on just to, to, to repeat conspiratorial fragments uh, or, or falsehoods? Um, Sort of tactically, like, is there, is there, I, I don't know, is there any evidence or, or research? Do you have any thoughts on on that as a as a tactic um, by by certain players online? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, it's used as a tactic. I mean, in the book, uh, I describe the the some of the writings from um, Joseph, uh, Joseph Goebbels, who was the Reich's minister for propaganda during World War II, who wrote about the the big lie rule, um, mm -hmm. and his strategy was all about repetition. Um, and in fact, the bigger the lie, he reasoned, the more unlikely it is that people are going to question it because, you know, who would assume that people would lie about something so grotesque? Um, and so the strategy of just making up outrageous lies and repeating them all the time uh, was, was, was a prominent strategy in Nazi propaganda. Um, mm. And it's, it's, very, it's very well known. In fact, Hitler said um, that it's, it's known to all expert liars in this world. Um, and so I think it is used strategically um, by actors uh, to manipulate public perception. Uh, and we've seen that with, with probably don't have to name the prominent politicians who, um, who, who've engaged in this. Um, but it, it's also interesting because it, it, it's not always about polarizing stuff. So let, let me give you an example, Peter. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in Spain, you know, Madrid is a city in Spain. It, it's the most populous city in uh, Europe. So there's a lot of people in Madrid. It's a big city, real big, a lot of people. 
And so Madrid is a city in Spain. It's, it's super populous, right? If you look at Europe, most people live in, in Madrid. It's, it's the biggest city in Spain. It's, it's most, you know, very populous. Uh, that's where all the, all the people congregate. Then a few seconds later, I'll, 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 so, I'm sorry to, have to say, in fact, that was total misinformation. Uh, so, so, right, so Madrid is not the, is not the populous, the most populous city in, in Europe. Um, but if you don't have expert knowledge about what the most populous city is in Europe, you're now going to think Madrid is now in your mind and it's going to be very difficult to, to get rid of Madrid. So I, I'm sorry, APA, if that was an unethical experiment. Uh, uh, but, you know, just 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 for the record, I'll correct it and say that, you know, this Madrid is not the most popular city in, in Europe, but that's how it works. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think that the sticky aspect of misinformation is something that that also gets uh, capitalized on, right, and 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 deployed um, and makes it particularly hard to to address. So so you know you cited the the example of of Nazi propagandists who used the illusory truth effect. I think also um, you know Russian disinformation campaigns more recently have have used that uh, just to cast a question over over a situation. So you know the the, the use of of Russian uh, force and, and arms in Syria or uh, human rights abuses in Syria and atrocities. Uh, they just wanted enough to, to question whether or not these things were being quote unquote staged, right? They were pushing sort of this false idea that, that these were faked or staged enough to just raise the question, right? Not, to, not necessarily to convince anyone uh, otherwise, just to, just to convince people that, that uh, this is a, an undecided thing. Um, and I think we've also seen that right in the climate change debate quite a bit, or so-called debate. Yeah, absolutely. So casting doubt on the on the mainstream narrative is a really powerful strategy. And so often people think, I see a lot of people from Madrid in the chat saying, oh, it might not be the most popular city, but it's wonderful. I completely agree. I just want to say that, you know, just a shout out to all the people from Madrid who, who, uh, who are that. But, but, but I think it, you know, it, um, it's a very common strategy. So people often think that these actors are trying to convince you of alternative facts, but that's mm -hmm. not necessarily true. That's not necessarily true. All they need to do is sow doubt in the public consciousness about a scientific consensus, whether it's COVID, the link between smoking and cancer, whether it's climate change. And the strategy is pervasive. This is also sometimes called by um, Naomi Oreskes, who is a science historian at Harvard, the, uh, the, the merchants of doubt. Uh, and there's been documented evidence that in fact, this has been their strategy to, to combat facts with sowing doubt, uh, which is much easier than trying to convince people of something. Getting people to doubt something is a lot easier than trying to convince people of something else. And so just saying like, oh, oh, well, here, here's these other scientists that don't mm -hmm. agree. And there, there are some, you know, let's prop up contrarians. Let's make yeah. them look like experts. Um, and that does a lot of damage in terms of public confusion. And I think that's hugely underestimated. Indeed. Um... Uh, I want to come back to that 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 question of uh, of propping up uh, um, contrarians and and um, in a bit. Um, I, I wanted to pivot to uh, to a question uh, or or a comparison about you know misinformation and viral misinformation with actual literal viruses, right? A lot of people have made this kind of comparison, especially around the pandemic, um, and. Uh, you know, it, it, it is in a way kind of compelling, right? Um, uh, um, if you compare, uh, you know, the way that, that literal viruses like the flu circulate and evolve, uh, the way that, that germs are spread from, an, you know, an inadvertently wiped nose to a touch doorknob to somebody else's hand, uh, or you map that against the way, the way that memes and, and other falsehoods spread online and, and sometimes evolve and change um, you know, I wondered if you could explain why, you know, this analogy about germs and viruses, physical germs and viruses, and then viral misinformation, you know, if you think that is, that's a helpful one that can help people sort of better understand and avoid falling for misinformation and also maybe take it more seriously. Yeah, I think it's a really useful analogy personally, partly because of, of the research that we've done on it. You know, sometimes people say, okay, well, you know, I get it with the pandemic and it's, it's an interesting analogy and it's timely. But in fact, you know, we were working on this long before the, the pandemic because the, the analogy is actually very close in terms of how you, how you can study this. And that is what makes it interesting to me as a scientist. So to give you an example, you know, we use models from epidemiology, such as the susceptible and covered infected model, 
uh, or susceptible infected recovered model, the SIR model, um, to study the spread of information in social networks. So we actually use the same models of how a virus spread to study how pathogens, information pathogens spread in social networks. Um, and so you have a lot of the same concepts. So, you know, you have a, a, in a network, you have a node or an individual that can come into contact with somebody who is quote unquote infected because, you know, the infectious individual here is the person sharing this information. So if another person comes in contact with that person, there's a certain probability that they will then share the misinformation. And then you can look at population level effects of how misinformation gets shared. And, and it depends on a number of factors. It depends on the, the, the period of infectiousness, right? It's, it's the same parameters as you would have in a public health model. It's the, um, um, the number of people that you that somebody else can reach uh, and, and so on. And we even have an R naught, right? The, 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 the average number of people that you then go on infecting if you've been exposed to somebody who shared misinformation on social media. And if you do these models, you can actually find out that most social media platforms have infodemic spread potential uh, in the sense that misinformation can, you know, can spread very widely across the, across the network. Um, and a lot of the other concepts are not just metaphors. So we know that a lot of asymptomatic people can spread a virus, right? But that also works the same with information. A lot of people are sharing this information without knowing it. So, you know, they, they, they're sort of asymptomatic. Um, and you can take all of that into account in models and try to understand this problem at a really at a, at a scientific level. And that also leads to thinking about what we can do about it in, in terms of, of, of intervention. So, yeah, I think it's more than just kind of a conceptual analogy. It's, it's actually how you can study this problem. And I realized that, yeah. you know, th there are ways in which it deviates and there are other ways to study this problem that are also completely legitimate. Um, but I think it's an interesting angle, I think, from the perspectives of understanding how information spreads in networks. Got it. Um... If I can put you on the spot real quick, this is something our team talks about sometimes. Um, you know, the fundamental difference between misinformation and disinformation is that misinformation is just false information, right? And, and is generally understood to spread without intent or, you know, in good faith, but, but, but incorrectly. So some people who, who like and share things that they believe to be true that, that aren't. So if anybody ran out of the room when you said Madrid was the most popular city in Europe and tweeted that, that would be misinformation, right? But disinformation uh, has intent um, and has a goal. And, and one slippery thing that we always deal with is intent is often impossible to determine. Right? You just can't know that, especially on the internet. But there is a bit of a debate, and it's a little bit silly, but I'd love your take, uh, on, on whether or not a piece of something that starts as disinformation, something that is launched with intent, but then gets amplified by people who believe it, uh, does that piece of disinformation then become misinformation in those later instances? Or does it always remain disinformation, but it's just successful disinformation because it's because it's tricked people? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think I think it depends on on where where you come in in terms of the the chain of events, right? Uh -huh. If you look at it from the perspective of the person who's initially spreading it, then it's disinformation. Right. But I agree with you that if somebody is duped by it and does not have the intention of duping other people, but is inadvertently doing so, then you might say that this person is sharing misinformation, although that's more on the level of the intent of the person. I think right. the, con the content itself is still disinformation because it was written to deceive other people, right? So it's... The, yeah. So I think it's, but, it, but it's a subtle and interesting distinction. So I think the content is still disinformation, but at the level of intent of the person, I think we might switch to saying they're spreading misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, in the book, I refer to this idea as the equivalence, uh, the observational equivalence paradox. And so, which is this, the awkward situation that it's hard to infer psychological intentions from just observing what people are doing. That people might think, and I think a lot of what goes on in politics is we're, you know, we're quick to judge people. Yeah. But I think sometimes, sometimes we have to take into account the fact that people could be exposed selectively to all sorts of content. And they might honestly think that the information that's available to them is accurate and that they're forming accurate beliefs because they find the sources to be credible because, mm -hmm. other, people, because other people they know find those sources credible. And they're honestly thinking that this is the case. Um, and I think that's, you know, 
it's hard to then say that people are motivated to spread bad information because yeah. it seems that they're motivated to spread accurate information. It just happens to not be accurate. Um, and I think that distinction is, is so tricky. It is. That's interesting. I think, yeah, thinking about the, the motivation of the person. So you have disinformation spreaders and misinformation spreaders. Uh, and a misinformation spreader obviously could amplify disinformation, but the thing itself yeah. probably stays disinformation. That's that's interesting. Um, okay, thank you for indulging me on that, all of you. Uh, it's a it's a, a, a nerdy uh, conversation that we, <laughs> we sometimes have. Um, okay, so I want to follow up on people who do spread misinformation, uh, or I guess it would be disinformation possibly with intent. So um, uh, people who who. Uh, you know, intentionally, knowingly spread misinformation. I think there's research to suggest that, that a lot of people obviously don't, don't know that the things that they like and share and, and maybe uncritically or too quickly amplify um, uh, falsehoods um, do so without intent. But there are some people who do so knowingly. And I think there's been some, some research around that. Um, I just wondered if you had any comment about why, what are some reasons people might intentionally spread claims um, that they know to be false. Yeah, so there, there are a lot of motives for sharing information that's, uh, that's false. Um, and, and that's why I think it's, it's such a difficult problem uh, to understand because it, it sometimes depends on the context. So there's a lot of interesting sort of effects. Sometimes people share misinformation um, because of what we call the, the interesting if true effect. And so if you're online and you see something and you're not quite sure if it's right, but it would be interesting if it was right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so you share it because it, you think it might be of interest to your audience. Um, sometimes people share disinformation or misinformation because it's you know entertaining or they, they think it's funny or because of outrage reasons. Um, but then there's this, this other sort of motivation that I think people share misinformation because it, it aligns with deeply held social, political, religious, spiritual, and other belief systems that people hold. And it's a way also for people to express their identities um, in terms of the groups that they belong to. So we derive part of our identities from the groups that we belong to, whether it's a political group or yeah. a sports team or uh, even, even a, a family unit. Um, and so sometimes disinformation offers an opportunity to either bolster the in-group and say, look, this is what we believe, or this is what makes my group look good, or it derogates the out-group. Um, and so it actually says something negative about people we don't like, and yeah. it's a strategic it's a strategic decision. And so people can be motivated to share information selectively or even misinformation um, because they have a motivation uh, to uphold and even spread ideological or identity-based uh, beliefs. And that's true. That's, a, that's the last thing I'll say. It's true in social media too. So we did a massive study on, on both Facebook and Twitter that I described in the book to see what goes viral on social media. And, you know, you might guess some of the obvious things that negative content's more likely to go viral, uh, emotional content's more likely to go viral. But one of the things that was most surprising to us was really that for every, so we coded the, the words in the posts, right? And so we had dictionaries so we could code the, the words. And for every additional, what we called outgroup word, so, you know, they uh, and, mm. and, and, other, and others, or liberal if you're conservative, or conservative if you're a liberal, every additional outgroup word really saw a massive increase in the odds that it would be retweeted or, or shared. Uh, and this was on Facebook, this was on Twitter, this was from news media organizations, as well as members of Congress, that we found that consistently derogating the other side is what gets traction on social media, at least in the United States. Um, and so yeah, I think that's a, that's a big part of the story. Interesting. To, to what extent do, do those deeply held beliefs and ideas uh, and identities kind of get get in our way cognitively speaking when we when we try to evaluate uh the the credibility of something we see yeah i think i think it depends on uh, on the context and so there's kind of a big debate about this you know some some psychologists believe that <clears throat> most of the misinformation is due to inattention and people people are just not paying attention we're bombarded by information and we make mistakes um or we get distracted on social media and then there's other psychologists who really think that, you know, this is all due to, to other motivations that people have, political, mm -hmm. social, and people are intentionally sharing this stuff. 
And I think the truth is that it's probably depends on the context. You know, in a lot of research we do, we find that if you're if you find yourself in a context that doesn't cue your political or social belief systems, then people try to be accurate most of the time. You know, they're willing to update their beliefs, they're willing to listen to evidence. But when you put people in a situation that amplifies their commitments to particular groups or in situations that challenge ideological beliefs in uncomfortable ways, that's where you see that people are more likely to then selectively use information to bolster their worldviews and in fact also spread misinformation uh, to bolster their worldviews. And one of the problems with social media, I think, is that it shifts, it shifts attention away from accuracy and it drives people more towards that identity-based kind of mm. thinking about information. Because we know from, from direct browsing studies, so, so we ask people to install you know, apps in their browsers so we can track what pe people consent to this, right? So we can track what, what people do. And most of the time, people just browse uh, random stuff. Most people are not highly politically active. Most people go to normal websites um, and, uh, and are not polarized. But then when people switch to social media, uh, it's a different story. And so that, that kind of leads us to think that there is something about the incentive structure of social media that puts people in a social context where different kinds of motivations are elicited. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't happen offline. It, it does, thinking about cable news, for example, you can have very polarizing uh, uh, TV shows and TV channels that people are exposed to, um, but it depends on, on the situation. Um, and I think that's often the, the nuance that gets lost in this debate between now people are just tribal, we're following our tribes, we're basically just walking around and, and we don't have any original ideas, we're just promoting our groups versus, oh, you know, people don't care about the groups that they belong to, we're just sharing things by accident, right? I think the truth is probably in the middle there. Interesting. And I guess ultimately, right, social media is, is a social phenomenon, right? The likes and shares feel good. They give us a hit of, of dopamine when we get them. Uh, and the comments, especially if we've, uh, even if I think we provoke a, a kind of a sense of righteous outrage, right? Or, or a, a kind of a, a um, response from our following that, uh, that, that expresses outrage, but in unity, uh, that that can feel good uh, and kind of raise people's standings in those, in those online communities. So very interesting. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to pivot now to, you know, to stay with this, this sort of epidemiological theme, but, but to pivot to solutions. Um, I, you know, I, you've also made, you know, the comparison um, between uh, some solutions to misinformation and kind of physical vaccines or treatments for, for physical viruses. Um, and this is something that you call inoculation theory. I think also sometimes you, you, you describe it as a kind of pre-bunking technique um, that, that you believe, and I think you, you have, you've gathered evidence that's an effective and kind of preemptive way to, you know, quote unquote, immunize people against misinformation. Um, so I wondered if you, if you could take just a few minutes here and explain kind of what inoculation theory is uh, and, and why you believe it works. Yeah, absolutely. So inoculation theory or pre-bunking um, is really the idea, well, Pre-bunking is the opposite of debunking, right? So it's, it's, it's a preemptive approach to fighting disinformation and it follows the vaccination analogy exactly. So if, if information spreads like a virus, then it's, you know, the idea was then we should be able to vaccinate people, at least in, in, in theory, against misinformation, right? Uh, and so you follow the vaccination analogy exactly, in fact. So just as vaccines um, uh, introduce inactivated strains of a virus into the body, which then triggers our immune system and the production of antibodies to help confer resistance against future infection. It turns out you can do the same with misinformation or information by preemptively exposing people to a weakened dose of misinformation or the techniques that are used to spread misinformation. And by preemptively refuting it, you can actually help people build up cognitive or intellectual antibodies so that when they come across the misinformation in the wild in the future, they've been inoculated, at least partially. They have built up some, um, some form of immunity so that they're not as easily duped by it because you've already shown them a weakened dose uh, of the types of misinformation they might come across in the mm -hmm. future. And you've already pre-bunked it. You've preemptively refuted it. Um, and so that offers uh, a major advantage, I think, 
to, to debunking. Um, and I'm happy to talk about some of the psychological processes that, uh, that create that advantage, but that's really the, um, the gist of it. And so pre-bunking, debunking, sometimes, you know, if some colleagues who, who, who wonder if people who are vaccine hesitant, to, to what extent they like the term inoculation, and so pre-bunking could be, could be another way to, to, to understand uh, yeah. the, the process here. Um, but the pre-bunk is actually the, the core bit. So, so psychological inoculation includes a, a forewarning that people might try to manipulate you, which is to, to jumpstart the psychological immune system. Um, and then the pre-bunk is the, the core of it, the, the preemptive sort of refutation um, of, uh, of a falsehood or the techniques that are used to spread misinformation. Um, and in very common terms, this translates to giving people the motivation to actually fight off misinformation as well as the ability to do so. Interesting. So not only would, would in theory, maybe everybody who, who was here when you were talking about Madrid would be immune to that particular falsehood. They also might be immune to someone making a claim. They would double check that claim wherever they heard it about the most populous city in Europe uh, from that from that dose, kind of. Absolutely, yeah. I would I would weaken it though, and so you would say, yeah, you would say, well, look, there are people out there spreading misinformation about what's the most popular city in Europe, uh, and they use tactics like repetition. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you hear somebody repeating a city all the time and saying it's the most populous, you should be wary of that. Um, and in fact, uh, Berlin or you know whatever the most popular city, it's actually shifted now that, that London is no longer in the EU. So there's a bit of a competition going on here in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, but you tell people what the actual most popular city is, and then you explain a technique in advance, you warn people. And then a week later, uh, that's what we do in the lab at least, mm -hmm. we then expose people to this kind of trick uh, and then we find that they're they're at least you know more they're more immune to it, and that's the power of of preempt bu building resilience preemptively. Um, the other way to do it, of course, is to come in after the fact and say, look, what they said was wrong, uh, but then then we're fighting more of an uphill battle. Interesting. So this works either with an example, like a specific claim, like the absurd claim that that uh, Demar Hamlin on the Buffalo Bills has a body double that's attending the games because he attended a game and you couldn't see his face. Uh, you could you could pre-bunk and inoculate people against a very specific claim like that or against a technique, right? Like photoshopping language on t-shirts is a common thing. So if down the line I see a message on a t-shirt, my level of skepticism is going to be raised because I've been exposed to that as a technique. Does it work on both levels, both in terms of specific claims and then techniques that 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 disinformation purveyors use? Yeah, absolutely. And in in foolproof in the book, I I explained the, the, the difference between what we call the fact-based or the issue-based vaccine and the technique level uh, inoculation or the technique level pre-bunk or the technique level vaccine. Um, and they both work, but they have different use cases and different benefits and, and drawbacks. And so I would say that, you know, when you want the highest level of protection, then being creating a weakened dose out of a specific falsehood and refuting that is highly specific, right? It's highly specific to a single falsehood. So you're going to have high immunity because you can inoculate people against a specific thing that's very recognizable and people know what's going on. And so it's, it's just, yep. you know, it's, it's, a it's one strain. Um, so you can be specific. What you lose with that is the ability to scale uh, because now you have to pre-bunk every, every new myth anew, right? And you can do that, but, but that's difficult. And so the idea behind the technique level pre-bunk is that you try to find out, okay, here's a bunch of misinformation. What's, what's the common narrative here? What's the technique that flows through all of these examples? And then inoculate people against the underlying technique. And then, in, in fact, what we do in our interventions, what we see is we, we then expose people to a whole range of examples of this stuff and find that they're relatively more immune regardless of the, of the specific examples. So now you've inoculated against a mm -hmm. whole bunch of, var of variants of the same virus. Potential drawback is that you can't predict the exact level of immunity against whatever example is going to come up. It's broad mm -hmm. spectrum, right? On average, you know it's going to be protective, but you have less control over, over the specific level of immunity because it's, it's more distributed, but then it scales. And so that's, that's kind of the, the trade-off. And the last thing I'll say on that is that, you know, tech companies, governments, media organizations, sometimes there are reasons where people either don't want to be the arbiter of truth or they have concerns about the weakened dose uh, and, and um, if it's controversial, for example. 
And the technique level offers a solution to that by, by basically using a completely inactivated string. So the technique level is, is usually very broad um, and uh, an example that's very general. So you don't have to touch on any specific issue. So if you're a tech company, and we see this a lot in the work that we do with tech companies, you know, they don't want to say immigration, they don't want to say climate change, yeah. this, that, um, but they're fine with explaining the building box of a conspiracy theory in, an, in a neutral example. And so that, you know, that allows other types of organizations and actors to, to, to adopt this approach in a very non-political and neutral sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when we talk to educators about these some kind of techniques or activities around this, you know, some educators think, well, I'll have students create falsehoods uh, and even maybe put them on social media, which we always sort of say, don't do that because I could contribute to the misinformation problem. Yeah. But doing this, I think the weakened dose and in a controlled environment and in a closed environment where this sort of can't get loose uh, and be sticky and cause issues and create confusion is, is key when I think when it comes to the classroom has always sort of been our, our advice. Um, I want to pause here because we have lots of great questions and lots of things happening in the chat. And I, if you see me looking left and right, that's why I've been sort of chatting, uh, looking at some of the some of the chatter here. Um, Cindy had a great question a, a while back um, saying, are people more susceptible to repeated misinformation if the topic is an area where their own knowledge is low? Like how, how much of an effect does education on a particular topic reduce your vulnerability to that sort of uh, illusory truth effect? Uh, yeah, that's great. That's a great question. There are boundaries to, uh, or we call boundary conditions to illusory truth, but they stretch more than you would think. So mm -hmm. we know that prior knowledge actually does not protect people from, from illusory truth. And so in the typical experiment, uh, what happens is that, uh, um, uh, you know, even if you know that the, let's say the, the skirt that Scottish men wear is called a kilt, um, even if you know that, if in the experiment we repeatedly call it something else and then ask you at the end what the skirt is called, people are still more likely to think that it's called something else, even though they, are, they had prior knowledge that they, that they reported that it was clearly called a kilt. Um, and so, and so you, you can do that with lots of information that actually just having knowledge about something um, doesn't necessarily protect you. And that has to do with the fact that people are not accessing it. Uh, in the appropriate manner, uh, and it doesn't come to mind uh, in in the example when 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 people are distracted, and so you can do mm. that with with lots of examples. Um, now, on the flip side, it is true generally that having higher media literacy, digital literacy, um, uh, education, numeracy, scientific literacy protect people protects people from falling for and sharing fake news. I mean, there's a lot of research on that that generally that does help. Um, and it, it does help people in terms of discerning what's reliable and what's and what's not reliable. Um, but that doesn't mean that our biases can't be exploited uh, in, in kind of almost a universal way by actors like illusory truth, right? You can have you can have expertise and knowledge, but still but still be tricked. Um, but this let me I do want to clarify that this is an example where uh, you're tapping general knowledge in, in people that they don't often use, and that's why mm -hmm. it can be exploited. If you're an expert and somebody's repeatedly saying false things to you in your domain of expertise, then that's going to be much more protective than general knowledge that you you infrequently actually use in, in conversations, right? So there are these, these boundary conditions, uh, and there are some things that don't work. Repeatedly telling somebody that the earth is, is flat uh, that's that's too far, um, and so illusory truth tends to tends to be much lower with with, with the sort of completely ridiculous content. Um, so yeah, so there are these these, these limitations. Interesting. Yeah, we did have a question about like what's going on in the mind of of flat earthers if they really believe it uh, or not. Uh, when you see that kind of rhetoric online, so it's interesting you, you mentioned them as well. Um, yeah, yeah. In fact, maybe real short on this. In the book, I describe uh, an episode from the Netflix documentary on uh, on 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 the you know behind the the, the curve, uh, mm -hmm. and they 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 actually the flat earthers they actually use a gyroscope uh, to, to to measure the uh, the motion, and then they they actually they realize that they're wrong, um, and that the Earth isn't flat, uh, and then they immediately pivot to like wow. And in fact, I quote this in the book, and I say, wow, that was unexpected. Um, and uh, we can only conclude that the scientific method must be broken 
Um, uh -huh. And so, it, so instead of updating their beliefs, they're motivated to reject the answer. So that's that's what you often get. They're so committed, they're so invested that there's going to be no way uh -huh. that they're going to change their beliefs. Uh, NASA must have made that gyroscope or something like that uh, to convince me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one more question from Scott here. Are people more likely to believe misinformation on issues, not that they're experts in, but that are or become political in nature, like climate change, COVID, uh, he lists crime. Uh, so if it's become a politicized, polarizing thing, I guess, does that sort of identity aspect of cognition kick in uh, than issues that haven't been politicized, like basic facts, like the most populous city in Europe, why or why not? Yeah, absolutely. So you see much more, you know, susceptibility goes up a lot and sharing goes up a lot when the issue becomes politicized. Uh, you know, you see almost, there are almost no positive conspiracy theories. Like, you know, you never hear people saying, oh, they were, they were plotting in secret to throw me a surprise birthday party, right? It's, it's always about um, something, something bad that's happening in the world and that's very, that's very political. Um, similarly, people, you know, there's almost no misinformation on gravity. Okay, people are not interested in, in, in spreading misinformation about gravity. So it's, it's, it's often tends to be centered uh, around issues that are heavily politicized. But then sometimes you, we can be quite surprised about, you know, why did COVID-19 become, you know, a real virus? How does that become politicized? So it is surprising, you know, the moon landing yeah. faked, right? Uh, and so the fact that we have rocks from the moon that they brought back isn't sufficient evidence for people to, you know, uh, and so it's, it, it is surprising what issues can actually end up being politicized that people thought were just obvious scientific facts. Um, but it, but there are lots of issues that we aren't politicized, you know, that you almost find no misinformation on because, and I think that's partly to do with the fact that it's not politicized. And so it's, it's not as much of interest to people and they're not as motivated to, to reject mm -hmm. scientific information. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that we have a couple questions uh, and a, a few mentions in the chat, I think it's just about conspiracy theories in general and conspiratorial thinking. Um, and, you know, I think one, there, there are some psychological appeals, right, of conspiratorial thinking. They offer very, very simple narratives uh, as, you know, as, as, uh, as tortured and, and, and uh, complex as the narratives are, the underlying theme is, is very simple, right? There's just the evil cabal doing all of this. Like, it's not really a, a complicated pandemic that I can't wrap my mind around this virus, how it could possibly do this to the world. Uh, it's a secret, it's a secret uh, attempt to do this intentionally. Can you speak to just sort of the psychological pull some of the reasons that, that that people kind of fall down these rabbit holes, they seem so absurd on their face. And I think it's easy to laugh off for some people to like, oh my gosh, flat earthers. But how do people psychologically speaking get, get drawn in like that? Yeah, uh, it's really it's really interesting because you know, obviously there are the severe cases. In the book, I describe a case of a man in Seattle who stabbed his brother with a sword to death because he thought he was a shape-shifting lizard. Um, and so, you know, I think some of these conspiracy theories, when they consume people. Uh, yeah. can really lead to, to dangerous consequences. Um, and so um, I think people, people do need to have some prior level of susceptibility to really get radicalized by conspiracy theories. And, and, and those factors are diverse, but we know that, you know, we know that spending a lot of time being isolated, spending a lot of time on, on, the, on the internet and social media, feeling uh, marginalized, um, that people, you know, uh, that, that you're not in power, you don't have agency. Um, people who are, you know, tend to be lower in terms of literacy and, and education and people who, who are more intuitive and less analytical. Um, but also um, people who are high on paranoia and neuroticism, people who are low on trust, very distrustful of official yeah. explanations. Um, so there are risk factors. Um, and then when that mixes with, with online phenomena like, uh, rabbit holes on YouTube. And I described the journey of, of one guy called Caleb in, in the book who um, has a profile in the New York Times about how he became radicalized by, by YouTube. Uh, because, you know, he did, and this is what I call the dance between motivation uh, and reason. Uh, so, so he did search for what we call gateway content, right? Some political guru who was yeah. mildly, ex mildly extreme but then there was a powerful algorithm that kept recommending that type of content to Caleb um, and he kept clicking on it, which reinforced the types of recommendations that he saw and just became consumed watching thousands and thousands of YouTube 
hours of YouTube videos uh, on this stuff. And, and, and that's where, how people become radicalized and start to do uh, dangerous things. Um, and the psychology of it, I think, is that conspiracy theories are very powerful at a psychological level. For one, they run like a multi-level marketing scheme. Yeah. Um, and so, so it's, it's once you've bought into one, you have to buy into several, and now it's no longer possible to, to pull yourself back from that because your whole identity kind of collapses, but because it's all related, it's all connected. Um, uh, it exploits the brain's desire to see causal connections where, where yeah. there are none. And there's three core, three core kind of psychological motives. Um, one is epistemological, the search for knowledge and simple explanations, what you pointed to. The second is relational. You know, people who feel lonely, who feel marginalized, it gives them a community. It gives yeah. access to like-minded people who can now reinforce and validate your beliefs and feelings. Mm -hmm. And then existential, people just worry about the world. You know, it's all uncomfortable. It's uncertain. It's scary. And so people want to latch on to comforting narratives. Maybe Sandy Hook were crisis actors. Maybe global warming isn't real. Maybe the pandemic is a hoax. Yeah. Um, and that's that's all much more comforting than dealing with, with reality. Yeah. Also comforting to think that you have some sort of insight that most most other people who who uh, aren't as aware as you um, yeah. don't have the, feel, right? the, 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 the feeling of uh, being special and unique yeah. uh, in the know uh, yeah. versus the rest of the sheeple. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so I want to pivot. There been a, there's been some chat in this. We had a question sort of planned around this idea of of experts uh, who who deviate from the consensus. Right. So every uh, especially scientific disinformation uh, uh, cluster sort of has this, right? So all the disinformation around vaccines, there are medical doctors, registered nurses, obviously a lot of naturopaths and homeopaths and pseudoscience uh, practitioners, but there are some like bona fide licensed MDs who are very outspoken and, and speak against the scientific consensus on something like vaccine. There are bona fide, you know, people with with scientific uh, expertise, geologic uh, and and you know atmospheric expertise that speak out against climate change, um, against the consensus. And again, these voices are are outliers, right? 98, 99 percent of scientists agree on on the uh, the consensus around climate change, but there will be voices uh, who 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 speak out against that. Those voices then get celebrated and amplified and embraced by conspiratorial communities and sometimes hyperpartisan communities who who see this or want to, you know, believe this is a legitimate debate. How does that work, you know, psychologically? How 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 can people sort of address this if they hear it from loved ones, sort of holding up like, here's a doctor, uh, they, and I could imagine them saying, here's a doctor casting, you know, vaccine science in, into doubt. They're a doctor, you're not. Um, you know, why should I listen to you instead of instead of them? How do you how would you respond to a family member? Or what kind of um, suggestions could you make to folks who find themselves in conversations like that? Yeah, I think it's really important to try to distinguish between whether this person is a fake expert or a real expert. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a, an interesting line, right? Because uh, when you have a PhD, when you're when you're an expert on some subject, you are an expert. But maybe sometimes people stray from their expertise for for other reasons, and that's a tricky a tricky line to distinguish. But to to give you an example, that's maybe a little easier, and then we'll get maybe to the more complex one. I in my WhatsApp groups there was a a, a guy called a Dr. Kimke, and um, he he was discussing scientific papers, very you know looked very legit, was wearing a white coat, uh, sending around the idea that that he had done trials showing that if you take a blow dryer and blow some hot air up your nose that it kills the coronavirus. Um, and, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but if you watch the video, he's showing all sorts of complicated medical words and papers. Yeah. And a lot of people in the group are wondering, oh, it kind of makes sense, right? He kills bacteria. And so, and so maybe, maybe that makes sense. But then when you actually look up this person, he has a PhD in, in education and uh, has no medical expertise whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and so in those cases, I think the best thing to do is not to argue about the facts of blow drying and heat and viruses, but to explain the idea of the fake expert. Um, and mm. that's that's what I did in my group. And I forewarned people. I said, look, there's fake experts out there trying to do people. Here's what a fake expert is. They have some PhD, uh, but they have actually no expertise on the subject and are trying to manipulate people and make money. Um, and so that, you know, that can be effective because nobody wants to be manipulated. 
um, and you don't get into this, this, this fight of your facts versus my facts. And you're just trying to explain and dismantle the underlying technique that's that's being used. And that's kind of the, the technique level inoculation, right? Um, and so that's, that's one example. It gets trickier when there is a legitimate doctor uh, who says something about vaccines, right? But again, if it's, let's say, a, a um, dermatologist who is talking about vaccination, right. um, one of the things you see with climate science is that the consensus strongly correlates with the with the expertise of the scientist. So the the consensus is strongest among climate scientists. And then you know, as you go down to you know meteorologists and and physicists, people who are actually in this broad area but but don't necessarily have all the knowledge and expertise, um, they're also in consensus, but less so and less so. So it's actually a function of how much how much expertise does a person actually have? Right. Um, and so that's where, you know, that's where, um, uh, where it's, it's difficult, I think. Um, you know, if you go to your local GP or your, your, your you know, local health practitioner and, and they're vaccine hesitant, people trust their doctors, right? Yeah. And so that, uh, it's, just, it's just very tricky. Um, and so one of the things you can do is to, to preempt people with the, with the power of scientific consensus. And so you can say, look, there's thousands and thousands of doctors who have right. independently evaluated things and this is the consensus. It's very, and it's always the case that some, that we're going to have some contrarians, people who don't agree. That's how science works. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we have to follow the opinion of every single um, person who deviates from the scientific consensus, right? right? And so I think you can you can try to inoculate, and that's what we did in some experiments where we inoculate people beforehand with what the consensus actually is. So then when people are confronted with contrarian voices, they can say, well, okay, well, there's a few people who deviate, but I know that you know, 99 out of 100 doctors actually right. believe this. Right. Um, and that's, yeah. Right. And that number is far higher for epidemiologists than it is, say, for, you know, general practitioners and uh, then far, far less for, say, chiropractors who decide to get on YouTube and uh, post a video about vaccination or, or COVID, which, which we've seen. Yes. I, I often forget that chiropractic, uh, that, that that's, that's uh, part of the medical profession in the United States. I think you are yeah, uh, 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 I mean, wonderful if people want to want to be a chiropractor, but in, in, the regulation is a bit different in other countries. I think right. um, around the, uh, uh, the the medical expertise of, uh, of right. that. And uh, in fact, during the pandemic, I will say that that a lot a lot of the you know pseudoscience uh, came from from individuals and practices who are what we call gateway, which is yeah. pseudoscience, uh, natural medicine, homeopathy. Again, you know. It's great if people want to do, you know, natural things. Yeah. Uh, but but that doesn't mean that they have expertise uh, about medicine, and it's often a gateway to, um, right. to pseudoscience. Um, great. Yeah. And we do have some resources, uh, you know, at, at NLP that we just developed. We spent a lot of the last year looking at science denial and science-based and health-based misinformation, both for our Checkology virtual classroom and uh, and also. Uh, we have an infographic, a new infographic with Dr. Cat, the epidemiologist on Twitter, uh, about levels of scientific evidence. And I think it's just, it's, it's a specialized thing, right? People really don't understand the difference between a, a, meta, a meta analysis uh, and a, and a pre-published paper, right? When they see it online, it just looks like scientific evidence of a thing. Uh, and then groups sort of are off and running and there's a lot of levels in between. Um, we, we, yeah, we I think a, for those level of nuances, you have fact checkers and and the bunking yeah. is is important in that area because it really takes a deep dive to explain the nuance of all of these things. Yeah. Indeed, um, we have a few questions about sort of effective ways to correct mis and disinformation. I know you talked a lot about pre-bunking and inoculation theory, but there are a couple um, questions that that hover around this. Um, uh, that if you've already missed the opportunity to pre-bunk something, you know, are there effective ways to change a belief? How can we better train fact checkers to correct mis and disinformation without accidentally increasing people's familiarity with the falsehood? So could could a fact check sometimes um, not just have a blowback effect when it threatens people's identity, right, and cause them to double down? Could it introduce the falsehood to someone who's never seen it before? Um, and, and what is what would your thoughts be just around effective ways to address uh, falsehoods yeah, and, yeah. and for fact checkers to, to sort of take into consideration when they publish their work? Yeah. Well, I will say that, you know, in our work, we look at the incubate following the viral analogy. Again, we look at the incubation period. Um, mm. So sometimes when people have been exposed, but not yet infected, you can still inoculate. It's called something we call therapeutic inoculation, which is kind of on the way 
So, so it's hard to know people's uh, quote unquote infectious status. Um, so uh, sometimes it could take years for people to get infected with a virus and sometimes it can take days. Uh, it's the same with misinformation, right? Sometimes people are exposed, but it just rubs off or you're thinking about it. Uh, and sometimes people become convinced and radicalized. So in those situations where people have been exposed but not yet persuaded, there's still some inoculation potential, but then sometimes you just end up having to debunk. And so the, the best way to debunk is to try to avoid repeating the misinformation too much. And so yeah. there's this, there's this, there was this big literature that kind of showed, okay, fact checking backfires, people get more upset, they don't want to hear about facts. Um, in fact, we've reanalyzed all of that literature. And I think the consensus has, con has significantly shifted on that. I think debunking and fact checking is, is relatively low risk and that most people actually don't have adverse reactions to the fact checking and debunking. It just so happened that the people, if, if when you do these experiments and you zoom in on the extreme people, that's where you see negative reactions. But if you if you think of the population as a normal sort of bell curve, that's a small percentage of the population, at least for now. Uh, and so and so you know, fact checking and debunking uh, usually doesn't doesn't backfire in terms of in terms of identity and, and politics. It can happen with, with individuals who are very politically extreme and active, uh, but, but overall it's pretty safe. However, there's other types of backfire effects or reinforcing effects that we need to avoid. And one is repeating the misinformation too often. And that has to do with how people's memory works. And so if the, the issue with debunking is that now you're forced into the rhetorical frame of the person spreading the misinformation. So you have to oh. say, they said this, and this is false. Um, and we know from research that just saying that something is false is not sufficient because people will have to tag something as false in their memory, but now they don't know what's true instead. So what do people do? They continue, they continue on with what they thought was true before because it's, there's no opportunity to really rewire your mental model. There's too many connections that have already been formed with the falsehood. Um, and so really what's most effective is a more detailed sort of debunk that not only says that something is false, why it's false, ideally the technique that's used in the falsehood that can identify the technique that's used in the falsehood. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and the evidence for this is, uh, is emerging. So I can't say that it's definitely the most effective strategy, but I think it's one of the strategies that avoids a lot of risks is what we call the truth sandwich. So when you construct a fact check or a debunk, um, you layer the falsehood with the truth. So you start with the truth, then you briefly mention the falsehood just once, don't keep repeating it, just say it once if you need to, deconstruct it, and then end with the truth again, yeah. so that it, minim it minimizes the risk that people will remember the falsehood and forget about the correction. And then if you look at the, the sort of neurological evidence for this, and that this is pretty new, um, we, we see two mechanisms. One is the, what called the retrieval error, is that people, um, they integrate the correction that you give them in their mental model of the falsehood, but then they fail to retrieve it when they're thinking about it. So that's a failure with retrieval. The other is a failure to integrate. People fail to link the correction to the falsehood in their memory. So they remain sort of separate. So the issue that usually occurs is that people are concurrently accessing the myth and the correction and they're competing for space. And so the best thing you know, people say, okay, what, what is all this neuro blah, blah. I think, I think the, 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 you know, the practical conclusion from, from this work though is the same. The correction needs to be so much more prominent than the myth in order to make sure that people integrate or retrieve it. Uh, and I think that's really the, you know, in the book, I, I kind of say, this is the, yeah. the, the key point. This is just the key point. If you want to avoid errors with people, make the correction prominent and bury the myth. Interesting. Um, I, I've got two more questions to wrap up if you have time to stay on. I know we're, we're, sure. we're just about at time. Yep. Uh, and the same goes for everyone else who's joined us. If you have to leave, thank you so much. Uh, I know we're at, we're at time, but we do have a couple of compelling things and I have a great sort of way to get, get from one to the other. I think they're, 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 they're adjacent. So somebody asked, um, how does trust in a person influence you know, your belief of what, of what they say, of the information they share? And I think this has come up in a few different questions and in the chat. This notion of, of social social standing and trust, people who are family members, who are close to you, who are your pastor, uh, your doctor, your personal doctor, people who, who you trust, how does that affect you know, our ability to, to detect misinformation when they 
either share it with us directly, say it to us, share it on social media, or even if you see what's sort of a passive share, like you know somebody you trust liked this post and then that like shows up in your feed, how does that affect you know people's, how does trust factor into to people's evaluation of information and those, those relationships? Yeah, I would say trust is very important. And so it's a nice, it, uh, WhatsApp is a nice example. So, you know, we did some work with WhatsApp during the uh, mob lynchings in India when they had a massive problem. Um, and, and one of the things that we learned about what's so different from WhatsApp, it's it's a closed, you know, end to end encryption system, right? And so one of the things that compared to Twitter or Facebook, you know, you get you get stuff from a lot of random people. But on WhatsApp, if you get forwarded false content, it comes from people you trust, people you know, uh, often, right? Sometimes you're added by people you don't know in large groups, but most of the time it comes from people that, that you trust. And so it inherently has more credibility and people are more likely to act on it. Um, so it, put yourself in a situation of some, some folks in, in, in India who were dealing with messages about local kidnappers um, right. with, with very specific descriptions. If you get that message from somebody you trust, uh, you wouldn't suspect that they have nefarious intentions, right? And they probably don't. They're, they're receiving urgent messages they think they need to share, and they're trying to do their best to be vigilant. But in fact, you know, somebody started this rumor because they're interested in instigating, you know, violence and conflict. Um, and so that's where I think trust can play a really prominent role in, in propagating misinformation. Uh, and so we inherently uh, trust uh uh, information more when it when it comes from from our in group members and people we trust, uh, but we can also leverage that in, on the solution side, right? The yeah. um, some work we do with Facebook on on debunking climate myths, for example, we try to use sources that are trusted across the political spectrum. Um, so so who's a good source for climate? Um, uh, turns out NASA is is a good source in the United States. Right. Uh, uh, um, um, maybe you know maybe some. Some sources are seen as partisan, even though they're not, right? But but it could be. So finding the sources that um, think about inoculation, we've been thinking a lot about who, you know, who's good for this. You know, sometimes it's scientific consensus, right? Sometimes it's it's it's. Uh, but but maybe maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger is a good inoculator for some audiences, uh, right. Uh, right? And so who do people trust and and look up to? Doctors are probably a good inoculator when it comes to, to information that's within their expertise. And so right. I think we can also leverage trust for, for, for in terms of addressing the problem, yeah. Got it, so that's exactly where I was going. Do you think, do you think then um, that the tide of public opinion around embracing and sharing this information, entertaining you know, false debates and conspiracy theories and things like that can be turned so that it becomes more socially unacceptable than it is today? And do you think we'll reach a kind of tipping point in public attitudes around this issue that results in a rapid and dramatic shift, you know, the way we did with the, you know, the sort of cascade of public opinion around smoking and seatbelts and things like that, or does the complexity of this problem and the, the, the many sort of psychological vulnerabilities that we have to, to misinformation make it unique and that we won't kind of see that kind of, that kind of change? Yeah, in the epilogue of the book, I kind of addressed this idea of the, the future of truth. And I think the mm. challenge is that um, what you said was really interesting because, you know, I talk about the, the idea of herd immunity and that the, the point right. of my vaccination analogy really is in the end that if enough people are vaccinated, misinformation won't have a chance to spread. And so the ultimate goal is a social one, which is to, to, to reach herd immunity. Um, but what you said is also interesting in terms of social norms that maybe we need to change norms around um, information sharing and, and consumption. And I think partly you can cultivate that, but I think what the problem is that we're stuck in this, this, this debate about facts and politicizing facts, politicizing words like misinformation. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that is getting a lot worse and that's not good. I think one of the things that I've tried to highlight is that we need to rally around the larger idea of reliability and trustworthiness that even though we don't agree on, on, on specific facts. I think we can reach consensus on what's generally untrustworthy as, as a technique uh, and what's generally unreliable uh, in, terms of, in terms of content. Yeah. Um, and I think there are these larger kind of meta narratives that we can, we can change the norm around that people will say, okay, well, let's think about reliability, right? We can say broadly that this kind of stuff is, is not so reliable, even though we disagree on some specific, you know, facts. And I think that will take us to a much more reasonable place than continuously politicizing facts because we don't agree on the, on the, on the, on the specifics. And so that's where I have most hope that we can actually reach some consensus about 
what's an indicator of trustworthiness and reliability. Um, and so that's, that's you know, yeah. instead of the, the sort of binary thinking about truth right. and falsehood, right? Mo most things are not just true or false. There's, there's right. usually a, a gray middle. And so I think that's, um, and then the last thing I'll say is I think part of the cure is uh, actively open-minded thinking or intellectual, you know, humility. I think a lot of the, a lot of the problems that we have right now is because it's hard for people to stay open-minded um and and sort of think well okay well maybe this could be true maybe that could be true maybe maybe you know maybe the truth i'm willing to change my mind but if somebody else is not willing to change their mind that leads to conflict and so i think if everyone was a little bit more open-minded and flexible um i think we'd, we'd have a chance mm. to uh to, to to move ourselves to, to a better place but that's not going to happen without radically changing the incentive structure on social media. And I say that because they control mm -hmm. a lot of the flow of information in society. Right. And it's just, it's not incentivizing moving in that direction. In fact, it's, it's, it's taking us, I think, down a, 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 a bad path. And so I think we need to, we need to change the whole model of, of, of yeah. what's being incentivized on social media. And that's, you know, full, you know, <laughs> Before Elon Musk, I had some positive ideas, but I'm not so sure now. And so, and so, it, you know, it will we'll see where that goes. Uh, but because uh, one of the things you're seeing right now is is further fragmentation. People leaving Twitter for you know post Mastodon. People are further fragmenting in terms of their information diet. They're getting into more severe right. echo chambers because now they're not. At least on Twitter, you were exposed to some alternative viewpoints. But if people are now going to herd, you know, all of the right. science people are going to stay here. All of the you know free speech people are going to be on Rumble. Um, then nobody is talking to each other anymore, and I think that's a real risk. Right. I love that. I like the idea of a of a of a uh, of a good faith, uh, informed, critical, open mind that doesn't entertain conspiracy theories or or debates that are that are pretty much closed debates, uh, but but do engage in in uh, in humility, like you said. Um, thanks so much for the extra time. Thanks so much for the conversation. Uh, Dr. Vanderlind and I really enjoyed this, and it's very, very helpful for, for me and for our, our followers here uh, and folks who've joined us today. Thank you all for the extra time uh, who are still in the session. I think we still have some 370 people who stayed late with us, which is great. Eight more minutes in, in this day and age is a lot of time. So I appreciate that. Uh, and again, Sandra, thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Yeah, thanks so much for the great conversation. And thanks, everyone, for the lovely comments. Uh, it, was, it was a true pleasure. Yes, we have more questions than we could get to, but hopefully we got to a lot. Uh, thank you all for joining us and be sure to follow the rest of our activity here at the remaining uh, day of National News Literacy Week. Uh, you can do that at newsliteracyweek.org. Find the rest of our resources at newslit.org. Uh, and again, thank you and, uh, and good night.